uh, Professor T. Lorerin, uh, who gave the seminar. Uh, this week, there's no one to introduce me, I guess, so I will skip this session. It will be, it will be weird to introduce myself. Uh, but I guess uh, most of you know me, and you will understand what I'm doing uh, uh, during my talk. Right, so uh, we're here to talk about vaccines. Uh, we're here to talk about vaccinations and emphasizing or uh, 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 hinting on the myths and the facts that surround vaccines and vaccinations. Uh, it's very topical, it's very timely, and uh, hopefully uh, each one of you can disseminate what you might learn today to other people so we can get the word out. Right, I'm not, I'm not working on, on, on COVID. I, I was never working on COVID. Actually, no one was working on COVID. We all had to work, start working on COVID at some point. Um, I was working on malaria, and I'm still working on malaria. So in uh, 2008, I started working on malaria long before that. Uh, but in 2008, I, was, um, I started coordinating a very large European uh, project uh, uh, that, uh, with many partners from uh, uh, Europe and Africa, and it was about um, transmission blocking malaria, transmission blocking, how we can, can we block malaria transmission? Uh, and uh, how can we block malaria transmission using either vaccines or drugs or genetically modified uh, mosquitoes. So I had to work with all those things. I'm not gonna work, uh, talk about genetically modified mosquitoes because um, um, uh, it has nothing to do with COVID. So uh, COVID is not transmitted by vectors. Uh, I, will talk, I won't talk about drugs. Uh, I will talk about vaccines today. So in 2008, after I started coordinating this big project, I made a tool uh, uh, around Africa. Uh, this picture that you see here is from a village, a very remote village in, um, in Burkina Faso, close to Mali, to the borders of Mali, uh, where we were uh, testing children uh, uh, for malaria, whether they have malaria. And uh, it, when we find people, children with malaria and of course you will find, I mean, 50, 60% of them will be infected with malaria. And unfortunately, a large fraction of them will die uh, from malaria. Uh, you will uh, invite them uh, to the lab, get them to the lab to um, test vaccines and drugs and other methods uh, to uh, stop malaria transmission. So you see this very lovely uh, uh, child there uh, being pricked with a malaria, with a uh, uh, um, glass uh, uh, prick uh, to uh, test for malaria parasites in their blood. Um, my trip was continued to Uganda, and this is from a uh, another village. I mean, in actually. The children. Uh, these are these are the, the children of the of the chief of the village. Um, all of them from three wa different wives. I think that he had those um, in uh, uh, southeast uh, Uganda to, to cross the borders of Kenya. Uh, again, malaria was very very prevalent there, highly prevalent there. The one thing that I noticed. So thinking of how can we stop this disease? And the one thing that you notice after traveling five hours, 10 hours into nowhere, no, I mean, the roads were very bad. Uh, you wouldn't see anyone. And then you arrive in a village somewhere far away. Uh, and once you arrive in a village, what you will see is a clinic. There's always a clinic there. There's always a hospital in the town there. So at that time, I realized that you know, we, there is the network that we need, uh, the social network, the social structures that we need to eradicate, to, to, to control this disease, it is there. So if we had a vaccine, it could be delivered 
to uh, uh, those remote places and get these diseases under control. Unfortunately, there is no vaccine for uh, those very prevalent infectious diseases. Uh, those are the big three, the, big, the, the most devastating of the infectious diseases. That's malaria, HIV, and, uh, and TB. Malaria, last year, just before COVID, uh, it killed uh, almost half a million people, 410,000 uh, people. It infected 230 million. Uh, mostly those are children below the age of five. HIV, we had in 2020, 1.5 million uh, new cases. Uh, TB, we had 10 million new cases in, uh, in 2019. Uh, we have no vaccine for that. And then came COVID. Uh, and to date, we have 194 million cases, give or take, uh, of COVID, and we have about 4.2 million deaths, a massive blow within two years, I mean less than two years. Uh, we have uh, uh, a large fraction of our population uh, suffering uh, or dying from this disease. Within one year of the appearance of COVID, we had vaccines. We had very safe, very efficacious vaccines. Malaria exists for as long as humanity exists. We don't have a vaccine. So let's start with these myths and facts um, that I, want, I wanted to present today. So people say that the advances that we managed to, uh, uh, I mean, all these new technologies that we managed to get with COVID because we pushed COVID so much, mean that vaccines for the big three as well as other infectious diseases are now near. And the question, is this a myth or a fact? The ans answer is, it's a myth. Vaccines for the big three are not delayed by the lack of technologies. We have those technologies the last two decades. Uh, and some of them, if not all of them, have been tested for those big infectious diseases like malaria, HIV, and TB. The fact is that vaccine development is delayed for those infectious diseases because of inherent biological issues associated with the infection with these pathogens. For example, the malaria parasite hides within the red blood cells, our erythrocytes that are circulating in our blood. It's the perfect hide uh, that a, uh, a microbe can have in your body because it cannot be recognized. You cannot start killing your red blood cells. It can't be recognized. So they hide in there. So you can't do anything for them. Um, they display great genetic variation. How can I describe genetic variation to this broad audience? So let's say what, what the immune system, we can train the immune system to do is to recognize, let's say, someone who's wearing because I'm trying to recognize who's wearing a red shirt or a T-shirt. Well, I can see Vasilis there. It's a bit pinky, uh, not really red. I can see Marina there, uh, a, a, a red one. But not, no one else, really. So if I teach the, uh, I teach the immune system to recognize the red shirt, it will recognize only Vasilis and Marina, no one else. Right? Because there's so much diversity uh, that the, uh, all of you present so much diversity that the parasites present, the malaria parasites present. They also have means of molecular smoke screen. You know the smoke screen when you, you, know, you just leave a big, big cloud of smoke at the back and then you disappear. Um, or if I uh, make the analogy here, you all take off your shirts essentially. You throw them over there, I will go and fight the shirts and I will not fight you, uh, 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 the parasites, the microbes. The red ones, not the other ones. Um, they suppress the immune system, etc. The HIV, in, uh, uh, similarly, um, they infect the very immune cells, the ones that are producing all these you know, vaccine, the antibodies and they fight the, the microbes. 
Is that too loud, Angela? Is that too loud? Okay, I will step a bit back then. Um, so, so um, the uh, so there's a press dose immune cells, uh, uh, and we cannot get any any immunity against HIV. We don't have any validated animal model. If we want to develop a vaccine, and the same happens with COVID, we have to have an animal model. We cannot just go around start infecting people to understand how COVID is transmitted. We have to have an animal model in place. Usually this is a mouse. It can be others as well, although there are ethical restrictions, for example, using chimpanzees or uh, 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 monkeys uh, for that. Uh, but uh, and usually it's a mouse. Uh, for uh, HIV, we don't have any validated animal model. Okay, so let's take a step back from here and let's see the history of vaccines, uh, of vaccination. We effectively knew always that if we get infected with, a, with something, if we got a disease, in the past we didn't know that these are microbes that they're causing the disease, but if we caught a, got an illness, we effectively knew some, that some of the illnesses will protect us. If we get around and manage to survive, we'll protect us for a long time. So we, we knew this uh, concept of immunity, of getting immunity to those diseases. Uh, at some point, we managed even to capitalize on that uh, and uh, uh, and mostly with this uh, smallpox, the big pox, the big uh, uh, thing that happened in humanity uh, close to after the Middle Ages, the Middle Ages, Middle Ages. Um, so what it was happening in China, in Africa, in Middle East, in the Ottoman Empire, is that people will inf be infected deliberately with smallpox. Smallpox can kill you. So I mean, someone, a, 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 an expert, will infect them. They will make a little scratch in their, uh, on their hand and infect them deliberately with smallpox. If they manage to survive, 97% of them or 96% of them did. Uh, other 3% of them died. If they manage to survive, then they're immune. And this knowledge was passed from generation to generation. So in, um, in the 1700s, uh, beginning of 1700s, uh, this knowledge reached the United State, States. It reached the uh, Massachusetts uh, uh, Bay Colony, uh, and it reached uh, Cotton Mother. And uh, some of you may know Cotton Mother. It's one of the founders of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, and one of the founders of the New England. Uh, he was a reverend. He was a priest. Um, so he had a um, Cotton Mother had a slave. He had lots of slaves. One of his slaves, uh, who he loved very much, he was called Onesimus. And Onesimus passed this information, he trained Onesimus, he educated Onesimus, and he passed this information to Cotton Mother that, you know what we do in, uh, in, in my place, and this was somewhere in West Africa, most likely Ghana, uh, we, uh, there are people infecting us with smallpox. If there's someone uh, that has small, smallpox, we will get some pulse from the pustule that uh, uh, smallpox uh, infected people had, and we get infected, and this will protect us for life. So Cotton Mother then started to collaborate with this doctor, uh, Zabdiel uh, uh, Bolston, and they started inoculating the congregation of Cotton Mother. So church and vaccination, it was, at that time it was called inoculation, uh, was very close together, we were going hand in hand. Actually, this is what started the anti-vaccine at that time. So people started to, you know, uh, resist to that. I mean, why should we get infected? And uh, there was all sorts of uh, demonstrations in, in Boston and, and, and elsewhere. But this, you know, collaboration between the church and, and vaccination essentially continued for years. And it was moved to actually to Europe as well. And, and the priests and the church was responsible for carrying out vaccination in most of Europe at that time. Sorry, it's not vaccination, it was inoculation. It was getting live pox and uh, 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 infecting people with it. So 
an observation that was, uh, that was also made by the public, but he, he reached this British physician uh, at the beginning of the 18th century, uh, or at the end of the, sorry, at the end of the, uh, of the uh, 18th century, um, Edward Jenner, was that the milkmaids, those that are milking the cows in, in, in England, uh, usually they don't get smallpox. They might get a, a mild disease, but they don't get smallpox. They were protected. So, and and uh, what these milkmaids uh, were getting, it was the pox from the cows, right? So they were, while milking, they were getting the pox from the cows. It was a, it's a very similar virus to the smallpox virus, which is called the variola virus. This is called the vaccinia virus. Um, we know now uh, name it vaccinia virus. So they would get the vaccinia virus, they would get the, some mild symptoms, and then they were protected against smallpox. So that's what made the change with Edward Jenner, uh, realizing that if you get the cowpox, then you get infected then with, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the pox, but you do not uh, uh, develop severe symptoms or illness, and then once you get infected, then you are protected for life from the smallpox. And this is what he did. And this was the revolution of vaccination. So getting the vaccinia virus, which comes from vaca, which is the cow, uh, vaccination means from, uh, vaccines means of the cow, vaccination means doing things from the cow. Uh, you will um, uh, then uh, be protected. So Jenner started vaccinating people with the vaccinia virus that you're getting from the cow. And you can see here a, a cartoon from the time where people actually were thinking that they may become cows themselves if they get infected with, uh, if they get vaccinated by Jenner and the, and the cowpox. You can see them developing cow noses and cow ears and all that. Um, but that was really a revolution in public health. You can see this uh, other uh, 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 drawing here from France, uh, which shows actually, if I show you here, uh, Angela, this thing is not good. Okay, so this is, this is Jenna chasing the Satan with his, uh, Inoculus here, the vaccination uh, uh, apparatus that he had. This is a pharmacist who was out of job all of a sudden because Jenner made uh, made it not made it happen. This is an inocular, inocular, whatever it's called. The other guy at the at the end there, the one who was inoculating, not vaccinating, with the uh, the smallpox, also out of job because it wasn't needed anymore. So you get vaccinated with the cowpox and you are protected and you don't develop any illness. This led to the next phase uh, and the, uh, the giant of public health, uh, uh, Louis Pasteur, uh, who got this information from Jenner and started developing other vac va uh, vaccines for other diseases. Uh, he started initially with uh, cholera, uh, going through the chicken cholera, and which he named Pastorella from Pasteur. Then he went to rabies, so he would get the, uh, from rabid dogs, he would get the virus that was uh, uh, causing uh, rabies. Uh, he will weaken the virus by passing it through another animal, like a, a rabbit. Uh, he will get the nerve from the rabbit, dry it out in the sun, and then grind it and then make this uh, uh, vaccine vial, and then he will vaccinate people. So that, that was great thing. So he was trial first in, first in dogs, then in humans. He was really successful. He developed other vaccines later. Uh, Pasteur was hailed at the time, and is still hailed as a national hero, uh, as a world hero. I'm not sure if it's, um, it's not very clear, but I, I, I mean, this shows the history of vaccine. So starting from smallpox uh, with uh, Jenner, 
we went to rabies, typhoid, cholera, plague, uh, diphtheria, that was at the end of the 1800s, 1900s. And we went down to uh, 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 hemophilus and cholera and I mean, all sorts of vaccines until we reach today the COVID vaccines. So what do the vaccines do? Uh, so the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, called the CDC, for the, those of you that know CDC, cited vaccination, cites vaccination as the number one public health achievement of the 20th century. So what are the major milestones? You can see them in this graph. Smallpox, which was a big problem for the time, was eradicated completely in 1970s. 1980, uh, WHO declared smallpox eradicated. It is not here anymore. It was everywhere. It is not here anymore. We are not expecting to have smallpox again. We eradicated smallpox. Unfortunately, it's the only disease that has been eradicated. We resist eradicating the others. Polio is almost there to be eradicated, but because of the anti-vaccine uh, uh, movement, uh, we have polio appearing here and there because people are not vaccinated for polio. Uh, and you see all the rest. Uh, uh, we almost eradicated diphtheria. I mean, you possibly know that you, when you were young, you got a jab of diphtheria, uh, uh, hemophilus influenza, rubella, mumps, measles, varicella. We cannot eradicate them, though. What's the problem? Well, sometimes the vaccines are not very efficacious, like the one of smallpox. Sometimes it's our own uh, problem. Like, the, uh, like measles. Measles, we're really close to eradicate. We can eradicate at any time. We have a really good vaccine. Uh, it was licensed in 1963. And then it was combined with mumps and rubella in this famous MMR, measles, mumps, rubella. MMR vaccine, the triple vaccine that we all get when we're young, about five. Uh, we, got, we get the first dose when we're two, about two, the second dose when we're about five. Um, so we have lots of recent outbreaks of, uh, of measles in developing countries, and uh, we have lots of outbreaks also in developed countries. And this is because of the anti-vaccine movement. You can see when the vaccine was introduced, sorry, I go back when the vaccine was introduced. Hopefully I can get this to work. Otherwise, do you have any, any, any laser pointer? Right, so, so we see the vaccine was introduced in 1963 and we have this massive drop in the number of, uh, immediately in the number of uh, 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 cases of measles uh, uh, throughout. And then you can see these little peaks and waves in the last decade or so, the last 20 years. And this is because of the anti-vaccine movement and because people choose not to vaccinate their children. Why do they do that? Because they think that uh, uh, the MMR vaccine causes autism. Another thing that we are hearing about the COVID vaccine, it may cause autism. Is it a myth or a fact? It's an utter lie totally a myth. Why did it come about? Because of this British physician who was working in the United States trying to make a name of himself. He published this paper in 2010 in The Lancet. If you know uh, of those business, that business, Lancet is the, possibly the best journal in the, in the medical area. So uh, saying that, um, thank you. That's better, yeah. Okay, saying that um, uh, the MMR vaccine causes, uh, uh, causes autism, uh, his study was based on 12 pre-selected children. 12, how can you make a study of 12? I mean, possibly those that are doing modeling and, and statistics and whatever can tell us. How can you make a study of 12 people, which, which we are pre-selected? We are pre-selected because they have disposition for autism, right? Uh, uh, and uh, claiming that the uh, MMR can cause uh, autism. The Lancet retracted the paper a few years later. Good for them. It was, it was very late. It was 12 years late in, in 2010. 
The paper was totally discredited due to the serious procedural errors that they have done, uh, undisclosed financial interests with the several doctors and, uh, and others, uh, and ethical uh, uh, violations. But does it matter? It's out there. It's what happens with the social media. How much you discredit them, it's out there. And as long as it's out there, it's difficult to stop it. So many other studies after that have proved that this is not correct. It's just bad science and deliberate fraud. And this is what it was. And why is that? Because autism often becomes apparent at the same time as the MMR vaccine is given. If you pre-select the children that have a disposition for autism, you will find a correlate, correlation. Right, what's an ideal vaccine? So an ideal vi vaccine has to be safe. It has to be immunogenic. If I inject someone with the vaccine, I have to, I have to uh, cause the production of antibodies. What does it mean? It means that it provides immunity. If it's ideal, then it will provide a long-lasting sterile immunity. Sterile immunity means that I cannot infect it whatsoever, and I cannot pass the disease whatsoever. That's sterility. It's stable, so you can carry it here and there. It's stable in the field. Um, by the time it goes to the recipient, it is stable. It's the same as it, when it started. Ideally, it's of low frequency. You can do it with a single dose, so you don't have to inject people twice. It's affordable. And importantly, it's accessible to everyone. You cannot exclude everyone for anyone from uh, getting the vaccine. It protects those at the ha highest risk, of the highest risk, through selective immunization. It can lead to control of the disease or it can even lead to elimination or eradication of the disease. Try to correlate those now with, I'm not going to do it for you, I'm, I will tell you a few things, with uh, COVID. So, I'll just pick a couple of things that COVID has said about COVID vaccine. Vaccines in general, COVID-19 vaccines in particular, affect fertility, cause sterility essentially infertility. Is that a myth or a fact? I would often ask people in the audience to tell me whether it's a myth or a fact, but I'm sure that you would tell me it's a myth. Uh, so the vac vaccines do not affect fertility. They teach the body to recognize and respond to an infectious microbe or virus. Why do people think that it affects fertility? Well, there was a confusion that was propagated by the social media. So the confusion came when um, there is another protein, which is called a syncytin-1, but we refer to it as spike protein as well. So most of the, vac all of the vaccines, actually, the COVID vaccines are against the spike protein of the virus. Uh, syncytin-1 is called also the spike protein. Syncytin-1 binds to the placenta or pregnant women to support the growth and the development of the placenta. Of course, we make the connection now. So we have vaccines uh, targeting the spike protein and it causes infertility. The two spike proteins have nothing to do with each other. It's just the name, nothing else, because they, they stick out, I don't know. Vaccines contain fetal tissues from fetuses which we killed to make the vaccines. Is that a myth or a fact? Of course it's a myth. Vaccine preparations, the virus, do not contain any fetal tissues. What is true though, is that for some of the vaccines, those are how we have been vaccinated when we were young, and the COVID vaccines, we are using what we call the cell lines that you see here. You don't see them very clearly, it's a bit bleached. Cells that we culture in the lab, we culture them in the lab in the last 40, 50 years, so that we can make them produce things that we want them to produce. Uh, and these cell lines originated from fetuses. They originated from um, uh, elective abortions, 
So we got the, why do we, why do, we do that? Why, why do we get cells from fetuses and propagate them in the lab? Because they're immortal. That's the good thing that you get from the placenta or from the fetuses. They're immo you can immortalize the cells. And you can get them forever. So you have a culture and you culture them and you culture They don't make any, any, any baby there, right? I mean, they're just cells on the Petri dish. And we grow them in the Petri dish and then we freeze them on the minus 80 freezer and then we cut them out and we grow them again and then we put something in them so they can do something. With the COVID vaccine, what we do is we... Uh, uh, um, infect them with the, uh, the virus so that they can produce lots of viruses. The cells are lysed, we get the virus and then we prepare the, uh, the vaccine and we go vaccinate people. Also for the mRNA vaccines, uh, we are using those cell lines uh, to make uh, some of the preparations of the mRNA vaccines. Okay, so put one and one together, that's two. Here we are, social media, uh, uh, we, uh, the, you know, uh, pharmaceutical companies are using fetuses uh, embryos to produce vaccines, and they're injecting us with, uh, injecting us with uh, uh, fetal tissues. So what are the processes to make a vaccine? What are the various phases to make a vaccine? So you all heard about this phase one, phase two, phase three uh, trials. You have the preclinical trials. Let me just explain a little bit, a bit, a bit quickly. So fa phase one, after the preclinical trials, whatever you do in the lab essentially to prove that you have a good vaccine, you have a candidate vaccine. Phase one, you, get a, you, you file a, 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 uh, an application to start clinical trials, start injecting people with that vaccine. Um, so in phase one, you have small groups of people receiving the trial vaccine. What you are assessing is the safety. It's a small group of people. In phase two of the clinical study, you expand your population that you vaccinate, and the vaccine is given to people who have characteristics similar to those that are affected by the disease, like the elderly, for example, that are affected by uh, COVID. And then, you, and this, therefore, they have the same age, the same physical health, the same risk group, and, and all that. And again, you test your, the efficacy of the vaccine, what dosage you should give, and safety. Phase three, you expand your study now massively, and uh, the vaccine is given now to thousands of people and tested for efficacy and safety. So another myth, COVID-19 vaccines were rushed and mustn't be trusted. Is that a myth or a fact? Of course, you know what I will answer is a myth. The speed of approval was due to cutting red tape and not cutting corners. We are not compromising the health of people here. We're not cutting corners. So the fact is that all clinical development phases were diligently followed in an overlapping rather than the staggered way that was done, is done usually with the vaccines, taking 10 to 15 years. In, incredible. They sh shouldn't be taking so long for a vaccine to be tested. In 10 or 15 years, uh, there will be, um, let me count that, there will be uh, about uh, um, 6 million people dying of malaria if you're testing a vaccine. About six million. Um, so uh, that's why we sped up the, the, the development of the vaccine enormously. There was an unprecedented international collaboration and funding that was given by governments, by organizations. We are all, you know, uh, shouting against the, the Gates Foundation uh, um, that gave funding for, for the vaccines. Uh, to create the COVID vaccines. And that's why we have the vaccines within a year after uh, they were, um, they start, we started working with them. There was a very large number of volunteers responding uh, in very short periods of time. And we have to thank those people that responded immediately to the calls uh, for volunteers. Uh, and you can see the call there for the NHS, for the, for the AstraZeneca vaccine. I responded to it, but they didn't call me uh, to go. So no other vaccine has been tested, effectively tested, as much as the COVID vaccine. Which ended up, we ended up with this timeline that you see there. Usually it takes 15 years or longer because we staggered, because we pushed, because of this and that, within uh, 10 months to one, one and a half years, 
we had a vaccine. Actually, this is a slide that I produced, I had before the vaccine was developed, and we were foreseeing at that time that it would be uh, about a year, 10, 10 months, two and a half years. Indeed, it was faster than that. It was a year before, after the, the COVID genome was sequenced, we had a vaccine. That was revolutionary. Okay, so another, I'm not gonna go through all this nonsense because these are total nonsense. I'm just, for fun, I will present because I, I know you will get, be getting tired. So fun, I will present a couple of those. So COVID vaccines are associated with the 5G network. Is that a myth or a fact? Of course, it's a myth. COVID vaccine uh, is spreading in all countries independently of their plans to introduce COVID 5G or not. Why is that come about? Did that come about? Because, oh, let me just put that as well. Oh, I don't know why is that. Anyway, that's the, that's the chip that they're injecting us with. Um, so um, uh, the confusion came because at the time of the, uh, uh, the confusion, it wasn't a confusion, it was deliberate spreading fake news, essentially. At the time that uh, uh, COVID emerged from Wuhan, uh, at the same time, the 5G network was tested in Wuhan at that time because you know the Chinese companies uh, uh, spreading the, the 5G thing. So, but it was many other cities, not only China, but that's where we are testing 5G before Wuhan, of course. Okay, but anyway, I mean, I, I, I haven't tested myself, but I don't think I'm, I'm connected to any network. So vaccines are being used to chip and track populations. They're injecting it with a chip. So they can track where we go, what we do, whatever we do, this or that. Myth or fact, of course, a myth. Vaccines do not contain any chips or trackers by, uh, for surveillance. Independent authorities have verified that. Uh, uh, and uh, they, they compete with each other, so you, don't, you cannot say anything about that. Um, and they approved the vaccines as not containing any chips. The fact, well, it's much easier to track the population with, in different ways rather than injecting in them with a chip. I mean, we all have a smartphone with us. Uh, we have been tracked all the time, what we do and how we do it. And there are many other ways as well. Okay, so um, I'll have to rush because I'm, I'm getting um, into the boring stuff. I will tell you a bit of the boring stuff, right? Let me just go through. Uh, so what are the types of vaccines that we have? We have live attenuated vaccines. So we get a virus essentially is live, but we attenuate them, we make them weak, we weaken them like uh, what Pasteur did, and then we check them so they will infect the people, uh, but they are not, they're a bit weak, so they, they, they are not doing anything, anything very harm, harmful. Uh, we can do this with uh, bacteria and viruses, and you can see some of the vaccines we are using today with live viruses, live, uh, live uh, microbes. Uh, we have the killed vaccines, so we're killing them. We get the viruses and the bacteria, but we're killing them before we, before we inject people, and we do that for the hepatitis A, for polio, pertussis, cholera. Uh, we have subunit vaccines, so we get a part of this virus, essentially now, and then we are injecting people with this part of the virus, this fragment, this... Uh, uh, um, protein, and I will come to that. Uh, we have the toxo toxoid vaccines, which are uh, uh, subunit vaccines, but essentially what they do, they target the toxin that this virus is produced, this bacterium is producing. Uh, so it's not killing the, it's not targeting the microbe itself, it's targeting the harmful thing that the microbe is producing essentially. So we let the microbe infect us, but we don't inflict any harm. We're not inflicting any harm. So, and we have these new vaccines with the DNA recombinant vector and mRNA. Everything has been tested for COVID. Um, so, for example, here you have the, have the COVID. So we got the spike protein. Almost everything is against the spike protein that we're using today. Uh, we had inactivated weakened vaccines. We have live vaccines. Uh, we had these recombinant spike proteins. We had the... Uh, recombinant uh, adenoviruses uh, that uh, uh, we are making them to express the spike protein. Uh, we have the, uh, the mRNA that is producing the spike protein. Another statement, uh, COVID-19 vaccines 
alter our DNA. You can see it out there a lot, right? So is that a myth or a fact? Of course it's a myth. No COVID vaccine can alter our DNA. What is the fact? Is that the mRNA vaccines never enter the cell nucleus where our DNA is stored, where it is. So the Pfizer and the Moderna, they never enter the nucleus. They don't have the capacity to enter the nucleus. They only extract our cells in the cytoplasm outside the nucleus to produce the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and they're quickly degraded by the cell. The adenoviruses though, uh, I should have some water, but the adenovirus vaccines, um, the platforms like the um, AstraZeneca and uh, uh, Johnson, the Johnson & Johnson, which are based on the adenovirus, they do inject their DNA. So these are DNA, the viruses that carry DNA, recombinant DNA. Uh, part of it is the DNA of the adenovirus, so that it can multiply and do its job. And part of it is the, is the, is the DNA that produces instructor cells to produce the spike protein. So they inject this DNA into the nucleus. But they don't have the capacity to integrate the DNA in our, in our DNA. They don't have the capacity to alter our DNA. Right, so our DNA is fine. We will be the same as we were before after we get the vaccine. Really quickly, I will tell you how, how this whole thing's wor thing works and, and then I will stop with that. So when we get injected with a, the vaccine, what happens, I mean, it's a lot of detail here and a lot of molecular detail. I couldn't find any simpler slides, uh, but uh, I'll just take you through very quickly. So when we get injected with that uh, vial that has the, um, okay. Then, our immune cells, we have some cells that are called monocytes and dendritic cells, like the, the dendro thing, I mean the, the, the trees, because they look like trees with the branches. Uh, those dendritic cells, they go there, they are actually here, where the protein that we inject is, or where the protein that we produce is, because if we inject the RNA, we inject it in our muscle, our muscle is instructed now to produce the spike protein, and the spike protein is every, everywhere around there. So the dendritic cells are always are also there. They go there, they get the spike protein, they say, oh, that's, that's something interesting, this is a foreign thing. They get another signal which tells them it's a foreign thing. So they get the spike protein, and they go and present it to another type of cells. They are activated, and they go and present it to another type of cells. Where? They go to our lymph nodes. Right, I mean the lymph nodes that we have uh, in various places in our body, or the spleen, they go to the spleen as well. They present it to the adaptive immune cells. These are the B cells and the T cells. So the T cells, what they do is they go there, they see what is presented, they say that's okay, that's, that's, that's good, it's something new. Let me, let me develop some kind of specificity for that new thing. And um, we have two types of T cells. One type is called the CD4 and the other type is called the CD8. It doesn't matter, but the CD4 are the ones that will, at the end, will help us to produce antibodies. The CD8 are specific to go and kill essentially. So if a CD8 cell recognizes something that is presented to it, it will say, okay, I will go and find where this thing is and I will kill it now. So they go and kill the cells that are infected with this virus. The CD4, what they do, is they go and inform the B cells now. They go and they present the signal to the B cells. The B cells are pre-programmed to have random receptors. Every B cell, they, we have millions of them, every one of them has a different receptor on the surface and they, are, they can potentially recognize everything. So it's, uh, there is a, a, a random randomization in the gene that is producing this thing that the B cell is recognizing, and it can potentially recognize anything that out there. So if there's nothing out there to recognize, that's, that's it, that's fine. If there's something to recognize, 
then I'll, I'll propagate. So this is what they do. The T cell is presenting that to the B cell. The B cell now uh, says, okay, that's, that's something I should respond to. It propagates uh, and it produces antibodies. And these antibodies are the ones that will fight the disease. So we have three main sub types of uh, antibodies, not antibody functions. The first one is the neutralization. So imagine an antibody is like someone covering you, so essentially coming and binding to the, uh, to the microbe, essentially, and saying that that's the, I'll bind to it, I'll stick to it. And uh, uh, one of the functions is the neutralization function, function. So they neutralize by binding to the virus. They will neutralize the virus. They will not allow the virus to go and bind to the ACE receptor. If you remember from the, from the COVID thing, these are acetylcholine receptor that the virus finds and gets in our cells. So they will not allow the virus to, to, the virus to go there because they will neutralize the virus. And this is how they function. And this is most of the vaccines that we have COVID. That's the way they function. And there are two other uh, ways that they function, these antibodies. They help the cells to eat the viruses and the, and the bacteria. And I'll finish with this scientific thing, uh, which is um, uh, how we develop memory. Some of these B cells now, we, they also migrate to the spleen and they, and, they, and they make this what we call the germinal centers. And there they grow and then they get some inputs from other T cells and they establish this memory kind of center. Once this memory center is established, then it can be, become long lasting by migrating. These cells are migrating to the bone marrow and there they are embedded in the bone marrow and whenever we get an infection, they will be reactivated, and that's how we get the memory. We have it forever. Okay, I'll stop with the science. It's just, it was just to understand how the vaccines work. Okay, so uh, we don't always get it right with the vaccines. For example, this is the vaccine for uh, dengue. It was a big fuss the last five, five years ago or so that we now have a vaccine for dengue, a major disease. Of, uh, uh, of the tropics, especially in, uh, in Latin and South America and Southeast Asia. Uh, devastating disease. Don't get dengue, never get dengue, or never get dengue twice. If you get the first time, you may be fine. If you get the second time, you may bleed to death. So, because the second time, it might be a different type of dengue. It might be a virus which is slightly different. Oh, no, it's not slightly, it's different from the first one. But the, the fact that you develop memory for the first actually causes you to bleed out uh, with the second. So we developed a vaccine for dengue, one of the serotypes, one of these types of dengue. You can recognize a dengue virus. And then we thought it can block it, and that's great. And then when we went to uh, the next year, many of those people died. Because actually what the antibodies were doing is, is helping the new variant of dengue to get in the cells. And what is what we call the antibody-dependent enhancement uh, uh, for dengue. Uh, we thought that this might be true for COVID. That's a myth at the moment. So the vaccines for, uh, uh, for COVID cannot cause antibody-dependent enhancement. If you get COVID the second time or the third time or the fourth time, you could be protected from the vaccine, with the vaccine that you did. How do we control the disease? So we get how, I told you how we get protected ourselves, how we control the disease now. We control the disease if we all get vaccinated, of course. We start to control the disease when we have herd immunity. And to have herd immunity it doesn't mean that we all get vaccinated. Most of us get vaccinated, those that are in the highest risk group. And the rest of us, uh, some, if we have very few of us that are not vaccinated, let's say, Okay, I'll pick Vasilis again, right? So let's say I'm, I'm, I'm friends with Vasilis, but I'm not friends with Michalis, right? If Vasilis is vaccinated, I will not pass my disease to Michalis because Vasilis and Michalis are friends, but I'm not a friend to, with Michalis, right? So, so if we get some of us vaccinated, depending on the pathogen, depending on the, um, 
on the, uh, the social structures, we may get herd immunity. Don't hear all these numbers. I mean, they tell you 70%, 80%, 90%. This is a moving target herd immunity, and from country to country is different. I mean, you can get herd immunity in Cyprus with 70%. You can get herd immunity with 90%. It depends on the social structures that we don't know, we don't understand. There's no model, by the way, in Cyprus that can explain the social structures in Cyprus. So if you get herd immunity, then essentially you tip the balance of transmission. So suddenly from being that way, just a small drop can go the other way. Uh, so possibly, I mean, one could think that maybe now infections are growing, but you see that they're starting to go down. If we get another 2 3% of the population, I, I am saying, uh, it might be wrong, 2 3% of the population get vaccinated here, we might actually get herd immunity for this particular variant, which is the Delta variant here in Cyprus. And with that, you drive transmission off the cliff, essentially. So there's nowhere to go. So it would be driven off the cliff. But you don't eradicate the disease. Unless we all get vaccinated, we will never eradicate the disease. And I'm finishing with that. Uh, so um, in order to eradicated the disease, we all have to get vaccinated. As long as there is something there, people that are not vaccinated, and the disease is spreading, it will always be there. We will lose immunity at some point. There will be another uh, variant coming, and then we will start again from the beginning. Unfortunately, it's likely that we will never eradicate COVID, and we have to live with it like we, we, in the same way we live with uh, the flu. But I find it very hypocritical, and you will see, uh, as we are going into the next school year, either we vaccinate our children, and we will have to get them vaccinated, possibly mandatory, as they will be doing in the US at the moment, or in the next year, or you choose whether to vaccinate them or not, or we send them to the school to get infected. Right? So I find it very hypocritical to get our children vaccinated and not get the vaccine ourselves. And I'll stop there. Happy to answer any questions uh, if anyone has. Sorry to bore you with technical details. Let's start with Marco and then with uh, Stefanos. Hi, George. Uh, thank you very much for a very informative presentation. Uh, my question is <coughs> regarding the speed up of the process for the vaccine development that happened with COVID, which of course, you know, I see it as a great achievement. Do you foresee this having an effect on the development I'm, I'm not talking about the technical issues, but yep. the, the cutting of red tape that you just described. Do you think this is going to apply to, let's say, novel malaria or dengue or, or any other vaccines that are developed? Is it likely to that people realize, well, okay, we can do this in a month instead of a year, so let's cut it up, or is it going to go back to the old paradigm? I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure this is what will happen. So uh, now that we know that we can speed up, there's no excuse actually to not do that. And, uh, uh, and, and, you know, put red tapes here and there, and you have to follow this or you have to do that. Uh, so it will be sped up, uh, and, and we'll see that with uh, uh, some of the vaccines. Also, the fact that mRNA now is so heavily tested, and we all approved it, and it's fine. And by the way, the mRNA, the mRNA is tested in the laboratory in preclinical as well as clinical trials, phase one, phase two, for two decades. It's not something brand new, as they all think, right? So, so for that reason, I believe that there will be, there will be a, a quicker uh, development of vaccines for other diseases. I just went back, by the way, sorry, uh, yeah, Stefan, get the mic, but I'll, 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 I realized when you started asking me the question, uh, Marco, that I put this at the back there, at the bottom there, but I didn't explain it, and I was certain that someone will ask, that's why I put it there, because there is this thing which is, might, be, might be a thing that, you know, whenever you tell people that you should get vaccinated and all that, that uh, vaccines are not really approved, they are conditionally approved. And un until they are fully approved, I will not get vaccinated. Uh, because having a conditional app approval means that they are not good, or we don't know whether they're good. So, 
so it is a thing because uh, in states of emergency, the, um, uh, the various authorities and the European authority, not the American authority, can give a conditional marketing authorization, not a conditional approval, a conditional marketing authorization. So you allow a company to market that on a conditional basis uh, because a state of emergency, a state of public health emergency. Um, so this is given to, uh, to, to medicines that fulfill an unmet medical need on the basis that you will present all the rest of the data to be evaluated, right? There's no compromises on the safety, but it says that, yes, I mean, you may bring more data, and I may need more data, normally need more data, but I'm fine with it, uh, and I'm giving you a conditional approval because it's a state of emergency. Stephanie. Yeah, so, so my, my question is actually similar to the one that was just raised, but do you think what has speed up the process was the necessity or the funds that were given for the process? And so applicable to other diseases, is it a matter of necessity or a matter of funds? Well, it's both, right? Um, if you ask me, if you're asking me whether if this disease was exclusive for the third world, whether we will have vaccine available, my answer would have been no, or would be no. Yeah, there was lots of funding because after, I don't know, decades, we have a disease, an infectious disease that affects the developed world. It affects us, not someone else that we don't care about. So there was lots of uh, pouring of funds uh, to that. And of course it was a necessity, right? I mean, it was, uh, I mean it's, a, it's, a, it's a real disease. I mean, it kills people, and it's very bad. And it kills people in social structures like ours. I mean, those are the way we're socializing the way we're socializing here, and that's why that affects less, uh, you know, people in Africa and, uh, and rural areas. So, um, so it was all together. Thanks. Okay, uh, yeah. Hi, thank you. Uh, so here in Europe, we've stopped at about four vaccines, I believe, the four principles, but we're getting through the Greek alphabet quite quickly in terms of variants. Is the research on the vaccine still ongoing and are we expecting new, more uh, efficacious vaccines coming up in case the variants keep getting stronger and stronger? Well, uh, so we have, yeah, so we, we, have, we have more than four. I mean, four are approved not currently by uh, European authorities, uh, but we have more than four. We have the Chinese vaccine, we have uh, the, uh, uh, the Russian vaccine. The Russian is very similar to the AstraZeneca one and the and the, uh, and the Johnson & Johnson, the Chinese, one of the Chinese is totally different. It's, uh, it's a, a live attenuated vaccine. Um, yeah, I mean, the, vac the, the market is so big, it's huge, right? So and we are, we're just at the beginning of it. If, we, if you imagine that this thing, we get, have to get vaccinated every year, most likely, we have to get a booster every year, like we do with the flu. Uh, the market is huge, it's a global market, it's everyone. So there will, there will be more technologies, more vaccine, different pharmaceutical companies developing vaccines in the future. Uh, and of course we have the, var the, the various variants. So we have the, the, the mutants. And of course we have the same companies developing new vaccines uh, in the future because uh, I believe at some point, if we let this thing develop as it develops at the moment, at some point the vaccines will not be able to stop the spread of a mutant that will arise at some point.
thank you for the presentation. I wanted to ask if uh, the vaccine, and more specifically the COVID-19 the COVID vaccine, could it be a cause for an auto autoimmune disease? And more generally, what could be the future side effects of the vaccine? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um. Okay, let me see. So there are many things that can cause an autoimmune disease, right? Uh, the COVID vaccine for the moment, I haven't heard of any side effects uh, uh, causing autoimmune disease. If you have, an auto, you have an autoimmune disease or autoimmune condition, then the fact that you're immunized might aggravate it, right? But the same is true if you get infected with the flu or the, or the, uh, the cold uh, or any kind of infection you have, because you are developing an immune response to, against that, then it might affect your autoimmune condition. So now, I mean, side effects and, and, and all that. Um, uh, of course, there are side effects. Uh, most of them are really trivial. And unless you are a scaredy cat, I mean, you wouldn't, you know, uh, have a problem with it. Some of them, but very, 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 very rare side effects can lead to severe conditions. Some of them can, can lead to death. I had a slide which I removed. Um, so we not we, and I, I'm not dismissing anything, right? I mean, the side effect of of, uh, of the AstraZeneca and uh, and uh, 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 what it causes, I mean, it's I mean, it leads to death. Uh, it is there? I mean, the platelet and, uh, and the blood clots. Um, did you ever thought about blood clots when you travel, when you take the aeroplane? I don't know. Maybe you did, but did it uh, prevent you from taking the, the airplane to go to your vacations? Uh, I don't think we do. Some of them, some of us may do, but I don't think most of us do. Uh, so the possibility of getting a blood clot that can lead to death or any uh, disability, uh, morbidity, uh, is much, much higher. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I, move, I don't have the, the numbers in front of me. It's a hundred times higher than uh, than than the than, than that. Uh, have you ever thought of blood clots when you take the pill, the contraceptive pill? The possibility of getting a blood clot from the contraceptive pill is much, much, much higher than the possibility to get a blood clot from the AstraZeneca vaccine. Have you ever thought of getting pregnant because you would develop a blood clot? That's the worst of everything, right? I mean, the possibility you get a blood clot when you get pregnant and you, and you have a baby is about one in a hundred, I think. Well, there are side effects, yes. I mean, we have the Guillain-Barre as well now. We have the, the myocarditis for the Pfizer. There are. I mean, we are vaccinating everyone now. We have side effects, of course. And unfortunately, some of those uh, rare side effects may hit someone that we love. But uh, uh, we are in a state of emergency. Hi, thanks again very much for your talk. I have a question that, that I, I think you probably don't have an answer for, but I do think it's important to, to briefly to mention it or discuss it. So I'm thinking like, uh, of course, it's very important indeed to also focus on the, uh, the vaccines and, the, uh, and looking at all the variants that are coming up. But also, as you mentioned, one of the biggest threats at the moment is actually misunderstanding of people and uh, the anti-vax movement. And I was wondering, what are your thoughts about where this is going with this anti-vax movement? And what are your thoughts are like about how we also as a scientific community can improve and uh, do something to, yeah, make the conversation in, in a way to go in a better direction? Yeah. 
Uh, I mean, as you said, I don't have an answer, and uh, most likely uh, we can't do anything really. But uh, each one of us essentially inform people that are affected by those fake news. Uh, but I mean, uh, tell them why they shouldn't be uh, believing this uh, fake news. Um, I mean, the social media is a disaster in that respect, right? They are propagating everything uh, uh, instantly, uh, uh, and most of the most of it that is there is really, uh, you know, fraud. Um, can we stop the social media? Yeah, it's very difficult. I mean, with the anti-vaxxing uh, uh, movement, uh, anti-vaxxing movement, it's really difficult. I don't think you can stop them. One can stop them. Uh, but there are people that we can stop, though. We can stop the doctors that are spreading the fraud news and the fake news. We can stop them from practicing medicine. Right? We can stop the nurses from practicing their profession if they are spreading the fake news. We can stop the teachers in the schools that are spreading the fake news that uh, poison our children from practicing their profession. I mean, there are things we can do. Just need some courage, I think, from the, from the states. Okay, that's the last question, and I, th I guess wine is waiting. Um, I was wondering what prevents us to have a vaccine uh, effective for more than one year. If I understand well, until now, uh, the idea <coughs> is the, that the COVID vaccination is limited. Uh, in respect of time, uh, can we expect to have a vaccine that will last more than one year, or the uh, variants and uh, is the reason that we expect that the vaccine can last only for one year, and we need to re-vaccinate ourselves? Yeah, that, it's it's many things really. So. Um, so the titers, so what is, what is very important when you get vaccinated is the antibody titers, how, how much antibody you have in your system, right? So when you get the first, the first dose of the vaccine, uh, independently of the vaccine, so you get, for, after a couple of weeks, you get some antibodies and they drop down. So then you get the second, the second dose of the vaccine and then they shoot up. Right, is this priming that we have. Now, it depends on then on the, and, and, and the, the COVID vaccines do a great job. They induce immunity, very high antibody titers as they should. Now, it comes to, down to the biology of the, biology of the pathogen. So apparently, the biology of the COVID, of, of the SARS-CoV-2, uh, makes it very difficult to not to escape before the immunity kicks in unless the titers are very high. And this is especially true for the Delta variant. It was true for the Alpha variant. It was more true for the Delta variant. Actually, it's more true, I think, for the Epsilon or whatever, the Lambda variant that is the, they're finding somewhere else now. Uh, so because there's so much titer, uh, so quick, to infect the um, our respiratory system, there's not enough antibody uh, uh, at, the, at the place to stop the, the, the virus before it infects the system. And because it produces so much viral load when it infects, then essentially we need a huge number of, uh, of antibodies to stop it. So I think we've done the best we could with that, and the only thing that we can can do essentially is to vaccinate people again and again, to give booster booster vaccinations again and again. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, let's go for some wine then. Thanks.